Welcome to another episode of Music Matters Podcast, and today we are stoked to have Rennie Foster. Rennie, welcome to the show, man. Thank Thanks you. On, bro. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Oh, we're Appreciate stoked to have you lot. on, man. Stoked to have you on, bro. We've got some interesting stories Cheers. to talk about. Cheers. Cheers, mate. I've got a stretch. Ah, cheers. You can move your mic if you want to. That's all good. It's all good? Okay. So, basically, I'm going to start off with a question that is basically going to ask you, where did you grow up? And basically, what got you in the path to your electronic music journey? I grew up in uh, the city of Victoria, British Columbia, which is on Vancouver Island. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I'm very, very early on, My some of the first music that I heard and uh, was... Um, exposed to was uh marching band music that was uh what my parents did professionally when i was born they owned a marching band called the canadian maple leaves really yeah and uh they would travel around to um mostly throughout the states Mm -hmm. and uh they would travel through the states competing uh and uh they would be usually the only canadian band in the contests or whatever that they would enter that's why they were called the canadian maple leaves and did you go to all of them did you as a kid oh, did you I, go along to I, them? I, well no not no. to all of them but i was uh very young i mean i was a baby when they, they owned that uh when i was born so some of my earliest memories so i'm i don't really know what i went to or not mm-hmm. right and uh some of the earliest memories I can recall are being on a bus, though, tour bus, with uh, lots of girls, because uh, they were all girls uh, drum band, drum corps, and mm-hmm. baton corps. And uh, my mom was a serious baton twirler back in the day. And uh, so there was a crew of baton twirlers, and then there was a big brass section, and uh, lots of drums. And uh, this was the 70s, so the music was very disco-oriented. Um, you know, they would do uh, marching band versions of popular songs. Um, and they were competitive, so they travel, they practiced a lot, and they competed a lot. So they were quite good mm-hmm. and impressive. And, uh, but I don't remember too much about it. Um, that was a long time ago. As I got older, they... Uh, left they sold that i believe or um went on to different things mm-hmm. yeah uh that didn't really include music except for you know uh, my mom my my dad was then out of the picture sh- uh, shortly after that so uh, and then it was just my mom and me and my brother and my um my mom uh during divorce put me in a uh community center breakdance program when i was in in the 80s maybe 1983 and uh i met my breakdance instructor was the first dj i ever met his name was rod mack and um he he, his turntables that he had set up in the community center there were the first turntables i ever saw and uh touched and um he gave me uh, and my friend uh, mixtapes to practice to, mm-hmm. and uh, those mixtapes were the you know the first mixes I'd heard, and I was really taken with that, really uh, blown away how the songs went into each other. It was like magic for me, really, and um, the music was like a mix of early club new wave stuff and breakdance music early hip-hop uh the word hip-hop was around but we weren't really using it in that way at the time okay Uh, at least i wasn't uh and um you know after that i became kind of obsessed with finding everything i could 
that had that vibe. So like, uh, you know, I got really into um, all kinds of uh, electronic influenced music from like the early hip hop and dance music stuff that DJs were doing edits and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then also uh, new wave synthesizer music, uh, you know, um, synthesizer and drum machine, heavy pop and rock production, you might say. Yeah. And uh, it all kind of just went together for me. I was really looking for that kind of uh, dance sound. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was really more of a dancer, though, at the time. So uh, I got uh, there was a period of my life in my early days where I was very serious about dancing. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, the music was more about related to it in, uh, in that way. And, uh, so I was a serious break dancer. I, uh, competed a bit and, you know, battled a lot and was into that kind of stuff. And also, uh, joined some dance companies in local dance companies. And, uh, some of my first performance experiences as a dancer with, uh, in a dance company, usually doing uh, in the eighties, it was popular to have breakdance sequences in a jazz routine. Mm-hmm. So I would uh, become involved with the jazz company to do these kind of sequences. Uh, I, when I was very young, I did uh, the Whiz in Vancouver, yeah, and that was uh, one of my first experiences performing in front of people, and. Um, after that, breakdancing kind of faded out of the mainstream, sort of what was popular. Mm-hmm. And um, I found that to be a bit of a wake-up call in in its, it, uh, you know, a wake-up call in and in itself. It influenced me a lot to be kind of underground-minded, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I realized at that time I was different and interested in different things than the mainstream was saying, you know, they were saying break dancing is out and stuff like that. And pushing this heavy, like kind of disco sucks part two rock and roll <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, it just made me more and more and more want to find it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And uh, I, uh, so a good part of my life is like about that and keeping dancing going. So I also, as I didn't, quit the jazz companies i stayed in and learned jazz and dance jazz and uh i wasn't a very feminine dancer but um the need for male dancers in uh from my experience during that time in the 80s anyway was you know these companies wanted male dancers right so Mm -hmm. i was able to apprentice and do things that was probably above my level because I was um, a boy who would do it, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, there, you know, that was a big part of um, my life—the whole dance era, dancing era, and then uh, hip hop. Kind of when hip hop, you know, rap started to come to the forefront of hip hop culture because it. At first, the rapping part was really not the major part of it. It was more about um, the music and dancing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. even the DJs were kind of like a mystery, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. yeah. it was really more about like dancing and partying and uh, graph too. Graph was like yes, graffiti was everywhere, but but um, graffiti was you know, yeah, graffiti was part of it too. And I did a lot of graffiti and. was arrested for doing graffiti in the States and many other have had a lot of crazy experience with graffiti art. Um, And, uh, um, you know, the graffiti art became a big deal to me too. The whole culture was a big deal to me. I was going to say it's all part of a similar package, right? Yeah, yeah. I I, I basically, I didn't really separate it as much as other people did. I noticed that right from the beginning too, that, that people would really get into like niches of stuff right where niche, where yeah. I was really more into like the whole thing. Package. Yeah, yeah. Right. it was like a lifestyle mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. me. You know, I lived it like a lifestyle. I think because um, my parents, you know, it was at a time when uh, we were 
had suddenly become like pretty poor, you know, comparatively. I wouldn't say like uh, we were super poor, but we were definitely struggling. My mom was a single mom who worked, who didn't get any child support or anything like that. I don't know that fit in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I had to find things to keep my mind off heavier things. I, I just, um, I don't know. I don't really know what happened at that certain time, but definitely 1983 was very pivotal for me and kind of cemented everything that I would be about going forward. Uh, at least at some point. And I, like, I don't think I've ever really stopped being like a B-boy, you know, like before everything, you know, uh, since then, since that time, Mm -hmm. it's kind of affected everything, you know, like I just look at things a little more colorful, a little more, um, like DIY kind of, uh, underground and, you know, like. I want to exaggerate things. I want to, um, I, I don't know how to explain it very well, yeah. but uh, those those two things so the um, were very, very influential to me. And then uh, going forward, um, you know, I was in a rap group called Sound Advice that uh, came about in the end of the 80s, the early, very early 90s. And uh, that was the second person I ever met with his own turntables was DJ T Double in uh, Victoria, mm-hmm. and um, another guy Degree One, and uh, we made a group called Sound Advice, and uh, they, uh, yeah, we put out a bunch of tapes, and uh, Mocha only joined us, and um, then uh, you know those guys went on to a more hip uh, after went on to be very important people in the local hip hop world and uh Mocha became a member of set of uh, swollen members and also um prevail one who was uh, kind of a protege of ours he was very younger than us and we sort of taught him the ropes you might say and uh hanging around with us and then he went on to become a pivotal member of swollen members also um, along with Mad Child, shouts out to Shane Mad Child, mm-hmm. and uh, he. Those days were also very influential to me. You know, it was like different eras of what I was doing, but even in those days, I remember being really interested in the dancier side of things, mm-hmm. where uh, whereas my cohorts were more interested in like the gr- grittier, um, the more street side of things, which yeah. I was interested in too. Yeah. Um, but I always was, you know, other friends of mine would give me mixtapes from the radio in New York or Toronto where house music was already kind of like going on its Off own, day, pre-rave, yeah. right? Yeah. Pre-rave. And uh, I was enthralled with that. It reminded me of the faster techno that, you know, like Cybertron and stuff that I was breakdancing to in the earlier part of the 80s. So I, uh, I really loved house music right from the first time that I heard it and um, was always trying to push it on my friends like, hey, it's the same as because by that time, hip hop had become like a thing, right? Hip hop. It's booming then, wasn't it? Yeah, it cemented yeah. before it wasn't a th- before it was like part of a larger thing, mm-hmm. which was basically now that I look back on it, I think it was a cultural sort of uh, reaction to disco sucks. Like, like in the seventies when they sort of, uh, the establishment tried to <clears throat> kind of like bury the disco industry. Well, right? the music comes from disco, doesn't it really? Yes. Yes. It so, it from it, yeah. yeah. So I think, you know, a lot of house music and dance music in general was coming from a kind of a, just it was just that stuff that had kept going outside of the establishment mm-hmm. right and uh and then by the time it it got big enough and popular enough again uh through the underground you know it, they were calling it all kinds of names i think trying to separate it really so it was like uh you know hip hop became that thing and then rapping really to the front it became really about rapping you know and uh I explored that too, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, but, um, the whole time I had this like 
feeling that, uh, you know, the original time that I'd gotten into it, the breakdance era, when it was really about partying and, you know, the mysterious DJ and the mixing and the dancing and the 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 energy of the music, uh, I never it never left me so I found that in house music and was eventually kind of I saw my friends were becoming successful in hip-hop like uh, with the swollen members and stuff like that and I I just didn't feel a need I I needed to explore the dance music part Mm -hmm. and that's when I really said okay the final the 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 uh, I'm going to DJ now, and it was then that you might say I took all the focus of everything I was doing and put it into dance music. Sweet. Yeah, yeah from about 1991 or two. Yeah, which is when 1992. Really yeah, yeah. And then that was that turned into uh, with a few, along with a handful of other people uh, that turned into the rave scene in our in my city mm-hmm. like yeah. yeah it was be it uh we we had no idea the word rave to uh, came f- to us from england yeah. from the press from the magazines right but uh, and we embraced that because it was like yes that's what we're doing you know what i mean but yeah. but uh we were doing it before that it was called that yeah, yeah. um making parties where we could play n- non rock and roll you know and uh dance and dance really it was just about dancing partying yeah yeah because yeah. uh, the rave scene kicked off obviously yeah in england was huge wasn't it we said many times about 1991 would you, no 1989 wasn't it for you it was around well no for me yeah uh, sort of late 80s pretty much early 90s 90 91 yeah, yeah. for sure yeah. late 80s uh, i was already really privy to what was happening in england yeah like i was comparatively to other people in my hometown because i was a fiend how did you first find out about it where did you come across it like in magazines or because tv surely you didn't have it on your tv back then actually we did no we did yeah we did yeah we had um really good um we we had much music back then, mm-hmm. which was like the Canadian, Canadian MTV. MTV. Yeah, but yeah. Oh, really? yeah, yeah, but yeah. it had a can you know Canadian stuff is always a little more grassroots sometimes you know, yeah. mm-hmm. and even the American programs we had that and that was good also back then at mm-hmm. that time, you know uh, there was the whole, I mean it had already happened sort of in North America with Detroit and Chicago and yeah. New York, oh, yeah, man, mm-hmm. right, uh, and even Toronto and Canada was well ahead of I, I would say they were ahead of England in in the house music way oh 100 right yeah, yeah yeah they had it right when Chicago had it right house. when New York had it they had it you know because mm-hmm. they're so close and uh, sure. so many there's so many black people in Toronto like a massive West Indian population and uh, you know that's where it kind of was at first was with uh, amongst black people and gay people. Mm-hmm. Right and uh, the gay gay scene in um, that time where they were already, I mean, already I was in tune with, you know, I was too young to get in clubs and stuff at that time, but I already knew that the gay clubs was where the music I liked was happening, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's where they were playing, like, you know, we called it all kinds of stuff back then, wave music or like Italo. Uh, oh, different totally just awesome. anything electronic is what yeah. i was looking for right like i didn't want this uh, the rock and roll of you know i i like rock and roll i love rock and roll i'm a big yeah. fan of rock and roll led zeppelin and etc et very influential to me and other rock and roll bands but i'm a fiend i just re- things i like i really have to know everything about it and be involved in it so i really was the kind of a collector and really looking like a I spent so much energy and time just looking for everything that was you know in this dance music style so things that came out of Chicago and stuff I was privy to those things in that way I would buy the tapes I'd be like the only one in my city buying the tapes I was like Richie Horton he moved from England to Toronto right uh, and then I think he's to go to no, no, he's from bit. Kitchener. He's, he's, oh, his or, uh, no, 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 not Kitchener. Uh, Windsor. 
Windsor, yeah. Yeah, he's from Windsor. Windsor. Yeah. And uh, he's from Windsor and uh, very near to Detroit. And uh, so, you know, he would, I'm pretty sure his whole, I don't know much about Richie. I've met him one time, but yeah. he's, uh, I like his music. He, yeah. um, he, as far as I know, he's c- c- came through the whole Detroit scene. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And me too later. But, uh, but at that time, I mean, I'd already been dancing to Detroit techno since the early 80s because I knew all of Cybertron's music. I had all the, mm-hmm. all the Cybertron music, the t- uh, everything that you can get, you know. Uh, and uh, I knew Sharivari. I knew all those kind of records. We didn't call it Detroit Techno then, though, right? We 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 didn't have like any names for anything really. It was like I remember calling that kind of music Boogaloo and stuff like when I was a kid, like mm-hmm. weird s- names, right? Like uh, like trying to explain what I was into is t- impossible. How how yeah. how easy was it to come by the music where you grew up? Like if you were on Vancouver Island in Victoria, like what record stores even had Oh yeah, that kind they of, had great, they had Lau's yeah. Place and stuff and they would bring in a lot of stuff because they were all like into punk, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, there was a lot of like punk culture in Victoria when I was growing up and those people, they're, you know, into the alternative yeah and alternative and really, record stores yeah. and things that come out on vinyl we've talked about yeah. a lot that i yeah. pilfer the dance much, st- section yeah like rave is very much punk ish a lot sort of, of a, lot, yeah. a lot of the a, a lot a lot of yeah. old punks changed and went into the dance and the rave yeah and hip-hop culture, too right there's a big connection mm-hmm. and uh you know um i find uh the media is always trying to separate everything into little things that's e- yeah, you know like that they can market reason. and they can yeah. sell. Uh, but really, when you if you're there at the beginning, you you know that it's all connected, right? It's all mm-hmm. connected. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, you know, uh, I mean, I I never had a problem finding. I I I had to work hard to find the music. But when but it I was looked, there. It, was there. it was there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I I liked showing people things that they didn't know. You know, I liked it to be hard. Yeah, I liked I I, I took uh, an pride and an enjoyment out of being into things that few people knew mm-hmm. about. And uh, at that time in the eighties, it was cool to be like that. There wasn't like a lot of, you know, mainstream. Even mainstream music was cooler then, right? So it was like people were into they they didn't have to have everything marketed at them so hard. I think. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Does yeah, yeah. does that make sense? Yeah. Like, yep. like uh, as we as I got older, I found that the mainstream media just got more and more intrusive onto like um, you know dictating what people what was in and what was out and what people should listen to and what they shouldn't. Right. And, uh, I think that, you know, it's the, it's like when people talk about the underground, you know, this is what I always think like this, you know, uh, that's the underground mentality. Like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's hard to put, uh, words to it exactly and define it exactly. But, I think it was that mindset really was like, I don't need the media to okay this for me. I don't need a million other people to like it and know it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm interested in it before it hits that. Like Mm -hmm. so many of the things that I got into became bigger and huger. Yeah. Right. So that also gave me a lot of confidence that I have, that I had a, I was onto something or that I had exceptional taste or something like that because I would get into something and and nobody knew about it. And then like a few years later, you know, a lot of people were into it. Yeah, I think... You uh, you know what I'm saying? I think as like technology's progressed as well, like obviously more music is is obviously coming of light now, isn't it? Really like it's a lot more, like I say, through the 90s and everything like that as well. TV, like I say, as technology's grown things are more accessible yeah you can discover more music as well obviously back then you had to really dig it out and find it really but then you when you found your niche and your, your, your genre that you liked it was like i found my 
I found my avenue. I can stick to this now. And it, uh, and along along yeah. the way, you're gonna see new stuff. You're gonna right, you right. Know, you're gonna you're gonna find new trends, new music, and that's the whole. That's the whole. I think the the wonders of fucking music, basically. Of the, appeal, right, right, the, right. Uh, the appeal, I would the, say. Yeah. The appeal I for something. Word, but yeah. And you know we, I mean? we've <laughs> talked about it many a time, like you said, when we were first raving in England when it was happening. No one knew what the fuck it was. You know what I mean? No, no one, no one had any idea what we were doing as kids. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the your parents, the government, the fucking police. No one had any idea what the fuck was going on, but it was happening, and it was underground, and you were part of this whole underground thing. Mm -hmm. And there was only so many people. There was lots of people, but there was only mm -hmm. so many involved in it. And right. you, all, and you all knew who you were, though. Right. You know what I mean? Like you could just tell by the clothes you're wearing. Yeah, there's a fellow raver, man. Yeah, I know. I right. know he is. Yeah. Right. I know I he remember. is just by looking at him. Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. I um, remember. I remember. Yeah. And, then, and then it became. I remember when the first ever rave tracks were on a TV commercial. Right. Oh there. Yeah. yeah. We were like, holy fuck, man! Dance music just made it to TV. Now it's on yeah. almost every commercial. Almost yeah. every commercial you hear yeah. has got some kind of electronic music in the background of it, right? Yes, but, yes, yeah. But back then, like, um, and again, who was the first guy that really, uh, what was it, Moby? Is, oh, didn't yeah. he have that one album where every single record on that album was yeah. used in a commercial? Oh, like, really? I think I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's got one album out I don't know about there. that, but I know oh, Go, definitely Go was a big hit oh, when I was a kid. For sure, yeah. Go, man. I can yeah. remember when it, it was, first hit the fucking charts. Because we, uh, we'd heard it in the rave first. But you know, he's, from, out he's from New York, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, he is. He's, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, it's, and that record was heavily influenced by Detroit techno. Absolutely. And was a big hit. Yeah, yeah. yeah a huge hit. Yeah, yeah. Huge hit. It was a game changer. Yes. That, and that was one of the ones that crossed over from the underground like we, yes. we'd it, we'd been listening to it for months yes months and then all of a sudden boom it went into the charts and yeah. it was a game changer it was a crossover track that went from being one of these super underground tracks that was mind-blowing the noises the sounds and now all of a sudden oh it's on top of the pops on a thursday afternoon yeah and that's yeah. Where and, it and, comes, your, and your mum your and dad listen to it yeah and that's where it comes you know into what you're saying like with the media will, <clears throat> will be like oh we can make money oh, off yeah. this yeah, and then yeah. they're like oh, okay this 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 put it out into the charts, Something which is what the like music that, industry yeah. is. It was the music bad, industry yeah. is all about that. Yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. it's you know, it's a, uh, it yeah, it is what it is, man. It's, it's just world. it's yeah. just a weird uh, it's a weird situation, but uh, uh, you know, I uh, those back in those days, man, the music was very inspiring. Every day there was a lot of records that came out, and uh, I was into. Um, a lot of English music back then, you know, 808 State and these kind mm -hmm. of people and uh, um, LFO. LFO, man. Yeah, and uh, Warp Label had some great old tracks, man. LFO. So many, Warp, really. um, so many of those early <clears throat> artists influenced me a lot. It's weird to think, uh, you know, back then at the early, some of the first English rave stuff that I really got into was a, a band called Alternate. Yeah. Two guys alternate. Oh, yeah, man. And now uh, Mark Archer, who mm -hmm. is one of the guys from Alternate. He's solo stuff now, right? Yeah, he yeah. has done lots of stuff on my label. That record I gave you guys mm -hmm. has a Mark actually, Archer should... remix. And, Mark uh, Archer's a fucking legend. Yeah. Right? And, Absolute legend. Oh, yeah. And also I've uh, remixed it, um, Alternate now. Really? The, the track Armageddon. I did a really? official remix for that. Oh, nice, nice. mate. Yeah. Fucking sweet. Is it yeah. going to vinyl? It's on vinyl, nice. yeah. With uh, it's a part of a double pack with like Kink and uh, geez, so many oh, great Kink artists well, on eh? that. Yeah, Fucking yeah, so picture, many mate. great artists on yeah, that. Yeah, we, Kink does a lot of live oh, stuff now, but he's a, 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 he's a, yeah, yeah. yeah, he's well into the. Uh, in, I think he's a big impact on the house and house music scene. Kink. Modern, yeah, yeah, modern yeah, yeah. House, yeah modern Straw house. Hill, he's yeah. good people. He's mm. a nice guy and mm -hmm. really good, talented artist. I've known, not known him. Uh, we've never met personally, but. We sh we certainly have chatted on the yeah yeah. Uh, he's a really good guy, very down to earth. What was your first raving experience that stood out to you the most, and that obviously you enjoyed? Obviously, you might have enjoyed every single rave uh, experience, but what was the first one you were like? This is this has hit me. This is the one that's really <laughs> set. I don't know. I, uh. I mean, all the early ones are really pretty special. 
Yeah. To me, but I mean, I've had a throughout my throughout my whole experience with dance music. I've had so many moments. That are just like, holy shit, like, this is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Like, so many moments, man. Like, uh, I'm blessed. I'm so blessed, really, about it. Like, uh, I don't know how, uh, you know, like, uh, some of my earliest experiences, just, I enjoyed... um, before I was really DJing at the rave and I was more about dancing at the rave mm-hmm. when I was younger, I mean, there was only a brief window, really, a really brief time. Because uh, as a dancer, I was really, I wanted the rave before it existed. And then once it existed, I really was ready to do do the music. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, uh, but some of the early ones, like we had this one called Ravex in my hometown, the fair ride at the, in the front. And I remember dancing, you know. I mean, my early experiences with, with ecstasy and dancing were pretty overwhelming, you know, like uh, pretty special. I... Before that, I mean, I hadn't put the ecstasy part with it, really, you know? And that's yeah. what the, that's kind of what the British did, mm-hmm. right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, because it really changed the game. It really, it really did. changed the it game. Really yeah. did. It was, was like the whole, a, the second summer of love. Yeah, was it was a English. really uh, very interesting time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it didn't last long. It didn't really last long. So it was so special. It was weird because when it was happening, it seemed like something was going to last forever. Like, why would anybody not want to do this forever? Yeah. yeah. But it, uh, it, it turned dark and lame, you know, like, uh, not lame, but I mean, it just turned more complicated, you know, more darker elements came into it. What uh, kind of what year was that for you? Like late eighties as well? Early nineties? Ni- in the nineties. I mean, yeah. it was... In the late 80s, house music for me was something happening somewhere else than mm-hmm. my hometown, mm-hmm. Yeah, right? And I was a fan of it, but there was like nobody knew it, like barely anybody knew it, right? I went to an alternative school called S.J. Willis after I'd been kicked out of a couple of schools. And one t- once I got kicked out of a high school for doing a rap show and making a, in the in the lunchtime and making a, a concert with my band and making up a track about uh, making up a song about the principal. <laughs> <laughs> and I was kicked out. Yeah, um, I went I take to. It wasn't a very nice song about it. Oh no, no, <laughs> actually, it wasn't very flattering. They had made the really bad mistake of of telling me it's okay if you do the rap show at lunch, but no swearing, right? Yeah. So, uh, you, when I especially when I was younger. It's really the if you don't want me to do something, don't tell me not to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, because that's exactly what I'll I'll do. I'll do that. I'll do it at times ten. Yeah. So I basically made a very uh, unflattering and uh, explicit um, freestyle about him, and then I was kicked out. <laughs> uh, yeah, I included some other teachers in there. You know, some just just uh, made whatever it could what i was saying stuff to get a reaction out of the mm-hmm. audience and you got the reaction they, they enjoyed it yeah they enjoyed it a lot i had another teacher come up to me and tell me uh that was great too yeah <laughs> yeah so i remembered that and she was like the prettiest teacher in school too obviously agreed with the lyrics about some of the <laughs> other teachers <laughs> um <laughs> yeah I, actually i've always had teachers uh supportive of my creative endeavors so, not all but some, Mm -hmm. um, but going to this alternative school, I met another fellow there. Uh, his name was John Cumberbatch. Uh, he's, he's still alive today. Unfortunately, he, he suffers from schizophrenia and is not, is not, uh, in a good, well, you know, he lives on the streets and stuff, but at one time he was, uh, very, very, uh, active in the scene. active, yeah, yeah. He threw the first parties in Victoria that you would call raves, and 
Uh, he was even throwing them before we called them raves. I think the word rave and the whole message from the British um, became quite inspiring for people who were into house music. Yeah. Right? Like, I mean, being, you know, not gay, first of all, and being like a little kind of rap, hip hop, dance guy. Mm -hmm. uh, like, although that sounds normal, if you think about like the whole, whole part of hip, uh, how of house music, like our man Van Helden and uh, Todd Terry and all that kind of stuff, oh, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. If it sounds normal to think about it, because there's there's examples now that everyone knows, but at the time, like, um, you know, gay club music was very influenced by Europe, like Euro kind of vibe and pop music and uh in my hometown right yeah and uh but some of the hipper djs like uh brent carmichael was a very influential dj in my hometown we're bringing you know playing starting to play the there's such a like i mean there's a special era when a lot of groups like renegade Soundwave and different groups were uh, bomb the bass and things were kind of like it's a it's a neither one thing or another yeah, yeah. you know what i mean yeah and uh so those introductions of those sounds were happening in the gay clubs but i wasn't your typical i mean i couldn't get into a club yet and i wasn't your typical like you know they're uh you know i was very like i am now right basically mm -hmm. yeah. so at the time but uh so there was like real cross like influence. There was a lot of people influencing each other, coming at it from different places. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Coming at it from uh, you know, uh the 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 place where I was coming from, like a more street music situation, and then there was people coming from the club, and then there was people influenced by the kind of blacker part of it that was happening in Chicago and uh and uh, was more like traditional house music. You know what I mean? Yeah. Organs, pianos, vocals, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Like the gospel that. side of it almost. Y yes, yes, yeah, yes. It right. wasn't much you would associate with like rave culture. No. Right? But all those things sort of came together, right? Uh, we at, at after hours and at places that I, because I was into all that kind of music. And uh, this guy, John Cumberbatch, also uh, was a very influential person in my city not a lot of black people in victoria but he was a black man my age who was a dj and he was influenced by uh guys like dan spedding rest in peace a different older djs in my city so he had kind of the influence of black and white worlds you know euro and black music american black music and i think it was really like at a weird point of where all the people that didn't want to stop dancing that really still loved the whole disco vibe and the club vibe um, that were part of that Eurocentric thing and part of uh, American black music kind of came together and made a kind of a hybrid, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Influenced by craft work and influenced by DJing in general, like how yeah. how DJs would mix the tracks would influence how the tracks got made and they started to sound more DJ-ish, you know, like more tracky. Yeah. Many of the like the uh record pools at that time, like Disco Net and uh <clears throat> Rhythm Stick and different things like that were very influential at that time, you know, doing edits of tracks and stuff. And then lots of uh tape sl splicing, double D and Steinsky, very influential. You know, uh, this kind of cold cut, they were around at that time, very influential. So many uh, kind of uh, these things sort of um, created the late 80s, early 90s sort of dance phenomenon. You know what I mean? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, go. obviously, these are all your inspirations that have got you into your... You know, your journey of music mm -hmm. obviously you found DJing you know off the back of 
dancing and stuff like that yes yes so when did you start to break into the vancouver scene and when did when did dj and start breaking into vancouver where Mm. you know obviously clubs were playing this music and you started getting involved in that scene well i had a club night in victoria yeah um called fluid that was in um the mid 90s um and started maybe 94 or 5 and was a popular tuesday night and i was playing a houseier sound so by the, by 94 raves had really kicked off mm-hmm. right and people were calling them raves and the sound was um the sound was heavy you know and uh house music had kind of like traditional house music had sort of retreated from the rave space and it was like a lot of break beats and hardcore, hardcore happy yeah, hardcore, yeah yeah early jungle yeah yeah, yeah a lot of hardcore not jungle yet but no n- not quite yet you know uh the west coast never really embraced jungle full on uh in the way that the east coast of here did mm-hmm. yeah they it was still uh, the tempo of house or fa- or techno, but you know, just a lot of acid and just like. Uh, it, it, I think raves had become significantly more uh, drug focused, you know. Or, oh yeah, you know, yeah, 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 and yeah. a little darker, and uh, the yeah dark music, you know, basically had had yeah. become popular. A lot of dark music, right, yeah. and. Um, I was still really like very, very caught up in what uh, Masters at Work and Todd Terry and Frankie Knuckles were doing or like the more soulful sound coming out of Detroit. Vocal house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Vocals, Detroit music, Detroit techno, uh, which was uh, different than the techno that they were the German kind of style that had taken over. Yeah. And uh, I... uh, Made a club night with uh, Martin Sitter, who went on to own Mac Pro Video, big uh, and uh, Ask Video, very uh, large company that does online tutorials for music equipment or music software and stuff like that. Very mm-hmm. uh, top of their industry. But th- that guy, before he did that, he was uh, basically through parties and club nights, and he had brought. Frankie Knuckles to Victoria and stuff like oh, that. Oh, really? Yep. Nice on the West Coast. And uh, we did, uh, we did um, um, a club night, Fluid, where I kind of championed that sound, the houseier sound, the club mm-hmm. sound. And I really was like, this is not a rave, this is a club. You know, like, mm-hmm. it was really like, in the mid-90s, I started to really f- focus the rave scene was so pivotal for kicking it off, but at that time, I was I more um, started to really identify with what was happening in larger club culture, like in New York. I really looked up to Danny Tanaglia and Junior Vasquez, yeah, and Mashes at Work and the Sound Factory and uh, different clubs that were popping off. Twilo, yeah. So I. Uh, and and even in England, like Ministry of Sound, you know, and things like that, were starting to show their self and be yeah. things. So I really, uh, oh, so breaking into the Vancouver scene, I did play a couple of things, few things. I would come over and play uh, at some after hours things that were going on here. At the time, mostly in the gay scene again. So yeah. there was like in Vancouver, there was a lot of house music in and uh, in there was uh, Tyler T Bone Stadius here, who was kind of like the ruler. Uh, he was really the premier house DJ, playing a really strong deep house sound um, in all the clubs and all the parties. And uh, I knew him from the club night and uh, from doing things in Victoria, and him coming to Victoria. So uh, you know, I met a lot of people and. Um, played some things in Vancouver. I played celebrities a really long time ago for uh with Dickie Do. He's another legend of that time here. And uh Richard and um he after those times, shortly after that, I moved out of Victoria. 
So when I really started making records and like putting myself up out there and I started to be in like music media and stuff like that, Mm -hmm. I moved to Tokyo and I was in Tokyo for about a decade. Right. So that's where most of my like higher level DJing happened uh, in Tokyo and in in Europe and in, in Japan in general, yeah. around Japan. I did a lot of residencies. I've always been really influenced by uh, residence DJs. So when things become very popular, I kind of lose interest in them, and I like the things that are timeless and classic. And um, when the whole idea of guest DJs, like traveling around and guest DJing everywhere and playing raves and stuff like that and their stars and everything. When that started to happen, it that wasn't really my interest doing that or emulating that. I was more into the legendary DJs like Larry Levan, mm-hmm. Junior Vasquez, these guys who had like a club. A club. It was their club. Yeah, their club right. and their mm-hmm. their their army their sound, of fans image, and yeah right yeah their style and yeah. their sound and their it, it's like an ongoing thing you know what i mean like people uh, came because of that yes like a, they like, came for that yes yes they came people right came for that yeah i don't know how to explain it but okay, I, yeah, yeah. yeah and and because my i had that club residency in uh, Victoria for about three years, very successful. We had like some great, very busy nights and uh, it it just influenced me. I wanted to do that. So what made you want to yeah. go out to Japan? Like what was, what yeah, was man, the influence? I'm, I'm like, what, what, you know, did it, was it just a conscious decision? You chose one day, I'm going to go. Did you meet someone or what was the decision? Uh, it's a long story, but um, my when I was young, uh, when there was a time when I was more uh, unfocused in my life, I did all this stuff, r- rapping and DJing and all these, uh, you know, things that mm-hmm. I was interested in. But the the group had kind of fallen apart, the rap group, or was falling apart, or just, I don't know. I was losing interest in the rap group. I was doing a lot of radio uh that's another part of my life is I've done a lot of college radio with my friends, um, promoting this music on the college radio, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, and uh, I, my mom said, uh, why don't you go to Japan and do this exchange program with this hotel where you can work at this hotel for a few months and live there and make some money and just like see something else, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She saw it in the paper, yeah. So I just message them and they said they need performers because they had they had some show going at the hotel so they were looking for singers and performers and you know i said i i I dance i can break i can do a break dancing routine and uh they liked that idea so i did that i traveled there and um cool danced in their breakdance show and uh worked at this hotel for four months and picked up some japanese and I it was way out in the countryside so you know I they had a club in the hotel as well that was defunct that was gone right and the equipment in there looked like it was from the 70s or whatever you know and uh but they had turntables in there big kind of broadcast style and I uh so I would get records and I think there is where I really decided I'm going to go when I go back to Canada I'm going to put all my other endeavors, graffiti, rapping, uh, all the things aside, and it's time now to do house music proper. Because up until that point, house music was like a... None of my crew were really into house music as much as me, you know? Mm -hmm. I was into it. I would show it to them. I would go to raves. I would drag friends to raves. They were all really, really very b-boyed out people yeah you know like yeah. hip-hop people and uh they liked it but not with the passion i did never fully right embraced, you know what i mean fully embraced it yeah you know like yeah they don't care you know like i'd be like yo man listen to this frankie knuckles man listen to this you know and they'd be like i don't know man it's okay 
Yeah, it's all right. Yeah, it's all right. You know? yeah, it's all right. Things were kind of homophobic back then, you know, like more in mainstream culture. People were more, I don't, I, my friends, I don't want to say my friends were homophobic, but I think generally young men were, you know, I, more I, I, like. I don't want to sound fucking bad, but I think it's quite a little bit of a more North American thing. I yeah, think. yeah, it was more North America. Yeah, I in think the North America. North America yeah. is definitely a little yeah, bit Yeah, no, my friends were very g out, very, yeah. you know, like tough. Yeah. Tough boys. Like it's not yeah. good. It's not okay. Yeah. F- to even think well, about it being okay. I don't think you that they I mean? really cared about this, the, that part of it. And, you know, when we met gay people, they weren't like mean to them or like call them names, but Mm -hmm. they didn't have interest in gay culture, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like I did. Obviously, I had an interest in gay culture. At the time, house music was very much gay culture. Oh, 100%. Yeah, Yeah. like all all the famous DJs around it were well known to be gay, and Mm -hmm. it was kind of like discos. It was underground disco. It was kind of like, you know. and uh, 100%. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I didn't ever feel, though, that, being involved in house music since the early days, I never felt out of place though. Like, um, there's a lot of people that aren't gay involved in house music oh, too. Oh fuck yeah, man! And no, it, I mean, and 100%. house music, once you get into it and you become part of it and part of the industry and stuff, uh, you understand it's more like it doesn't matter. People are gay or they're not gay; it doesn't matter as long as you don't care that. It, as long as you don't care about it, then there's no like. I never have have in my whole time even i've done so many records from detroit labels and been to detroit a lot and stuff like that i've never felt looked down upon for being white or not gay well, no, by, I, think, I think by black guys or gay guys yeah i mean uh, yeah. house music never. is house music and yeah. i think music in general is the key for yes. unity if you love house music and they love house music yeah. especially at that time because it was so small and rare yeah right that you have this bond like oh you get it you get what this is right like that was kind of enough to cement you together i think, yeah. I think honestly i think that's like the key to the whole thing that makes dance music what it is is yes that it brought together yes so many different groups of people yeah well i especially think especially like and again sorry i didn't mean to cut you off that's all right yeah. like you said when the ecstasy got involved, yes that's what i was just gonna say when when yeah. ecstasy that the, the yeah. music was there the music was there and it had been there for a bit and then all right. of a sudden a few fucking really nice people threw ecstasy into the mix. Yeah, that's and right. All of a sudden, <laughs> a few very nice people. All, yeah. all, all these fucking groups of people that in the past, tough boys, tough boys, yeah. fucking gay people. They could people all see what, each other well. Yeah, and, and 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 it just opened up the doors of well, fuck. None of that's important, really, is Re- it? Yes. The, yeah, that's right. The only right. thing that's Quite. important right now is we're on a dance floor. This tune's playing. It's banging. It sounds fucking amazing. Yeah. And I love you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I it took away a lot of right. you know egos, I mean? didn't it? It took away so much shit, man. Yeah, so it, it, it was. It, it, took, it, it, it fucking changed yeah. the world. That's it right. Changed, it changed the world. No, it you're did, absolutely yeah. There's no right. doubt about yeah. it. It changed the world we live in. I agree 100%. Right. Right. That's yeah. a kind of why I'm still doing all this stuff. Yeah, man. Exactly. That's why we're all yeah. in it, right? That's why we do this podcast, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It does it's matter uh, to fucking many people and what it does do. That's right. And there's no denying that it was the combination of the time it happened... Right. Some some might say in England the politics that were involved because right. it was a big, Politic it was a punky yeah. kind of movement. Right, the right. Youth DIY, DIY, saying, fuck off, rebellious, right, yeah. rebellious yeah. shit. Saying yeah. now nah, we're going to do this, but ultimately it was like the music and the drugs and the groups of people that were right. involved in it coming together, and it just changed the world we live mm, in right, right now. Yeah. As did some other eras. Yeah, back in the I day. I think drugs. Do you know what I mean? I think drugs. Uh, you know. Um, I've been around subculture all my life, lived inside it as my lifestyle. So, you know, I know, I think drugs have been involved in uh, subculture forever, forever. Forever. I've never seen it not. And that includes alcohol. But I, uh, I never saw anything in that. So it's, it's even hard for, you know, like, I want to say it was kind of a fluke. You know, what happened with um, the dance music the the that era of the crossing over of the 80s and 90s and then the ecstasy those that time and that 
place and that soundtrack and that drug, not drugs in that general, drug. because I saw yeah. other drugs kind of um, work against the cause, you know, like uh, that's kind of you know, other drugs that came in sort of, um, I mean, they're there. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not, uh, I'm not naive, you know, uh, I'm coming at it more from the music place, but I've been there and I know uh in the underground what it's all about so you know <laughs> i'm not uh like anti-drug or anything like that but it's not really my thing but um the ecstasy part was different than the other drugs mm -hmm. it's like they say uh the ecstasy started from like um uh, a pharmaceutical that helped uh, marriage counseling or something. And I can totally see that because I think we all needed counseling, you know, mm -hmm. at that time. And it kind of broke down some sort of barrier. Like I think it broke yeah. down a lot of social barriers. Yeah, social it, barriers. It, it, it yeah. came along at a time where yeah. social situations were very tense at the time, yeah. especially in England. Right. Like things were tense. Unemployment was high. Right. Fucking Margaret Thatcher and the politics were fucked at the time. People were, you know, fucking broken. Society was broken. And then this little magic, happy drug came along. Sort of, that yeah. broke yeah. down the barriers and, 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 and broke down the um, lines in between people within cultures. Yeah. People that used to look at each other and be like, fuck you. Right. All of a sudden looked at each other and were like, you're all right. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. No, that's I can, yeah. I can I can deal yeah, with no, that. No, if, no, you can, yeah. if you can deal yeah. with me, I can deal with you. I grew up. Uh, you know, I grew up with a really tough group of kids. You know, tough, tough group of kids. And uh, as far as I knew, until that time, it was almost dangerous to be too nice to people. Mm -hmm. You know, like you don't want to be someone who's seen as being too nice that's dangerous you're like it's a like mark an advantage, yeah. you know like yeah, yeah. and uh it, there was just a lot of like i'm down for my friends i'm down for me and my crew that was yeah you know that was kind of how i was raised in that kind of scenario right and uh i found that that the whole rave situation of the early 90s put a lot of different people together in a room, mm -hmm. gave them a good positive thing to focus on. And then this, there, there was the drug part of it. And then it was like, uh, just the ecstasy part though. I want to reiterate because really the first experiences I had, nobody was doing anything else. Nobody was even drinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, we didn't. Use yeah. To. There was no drinking. There was no, people might smoke weed outside. The odd weirdo might be like, I'm on acid or something, but there was nothing dark, really. It was just like people on ecstasy, and they were all like hugging and nice and polite, and like yeah. like we can control our anger. We don't we don't have to fight and be mad at each other. And it was like such a relief. It's such a big part of yeah, the yeah. scene and the culture. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I was gonna say, um, with moving. F uh, Obviously, moving into the Vancouver scene when you DJ, like moving into the DJ scene in Vancouver. What clubs did you like s start in? Oh yeah, the Vancouver thing. We yeah. were, I totally went off topic. That's, that's eh? fine, yeah, yeah. Man, yeah. Like, well, what, like, what clubs did you play, and what were your favorite? Like back then and now, or the same ones? Well, back then I used to play things like the Gallery, which was like an underground, and the World, which were like basically mixed after hours. So there'd be like a lot of gay people there, about half. Mm -hmm. And uh, we called that mixed back in the day, right? All the clubs that I first started playing at in Victoria and Vancouver were mixed clubs. That's where, that's where like the cool part, the people who were interested in cool music could go and they could be straight and, and uh, the gay people that were there were uh, accepting of them. Welcome, yeah. They didn't feel, they, they were gay people who were like straight friendly. So it wasn't much of a, uh, the pickup part wasn't as big of a thing. Like music clubs, 
mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It, the the people that were there for the music. So it didn't matter really much if you were gay or straight. So these these were like mixed clubs, but you know, people there was people in drag and stuff like that. And uh, I'd play at those kind of places uh, back in the day. Um, and then uh, I moved away. And uh, they did, I did the Tokyo thing. We can talk about that later. Yeah, well, I don't know, because obviously, yeah, yeah. I guess you can Well, speak. we'll get into that later, because it's a whole other thing. Yeah. But I moved back to, and then I almost didn't, I, I totally forgot about Canada, right? I started making records, and my records didn't never, they didn't sell in Canada that much. Uh, you know, some did i guess there were I, people bought my records in canada but i mean nothing compared to what i sold in europe and in in asia mm-hmm. so my focus was like i mean i was younger i'd kind of gone through the whole local scene thing and scene building and making parties and community and all that stuff it had already kind of been a long journey for me of that and then when my start records started popping off like at that time, the the scene in in Victoria was more competitive. There was more people doing it, and I was like, "Hey, I'm making records on these labels." And you know, some people thought that was cool, but some people thought that you know, I was they painted me to be very egotistical or something, which I don't really think I was ever very egotistical. But they would, you know. They would pretend that it was nothing. And then if I said, hey, man, I'm doing all this stuff, they'd be like, look, he has such an ego, you know? Mm-hmm. That's And they kind of, uh, I didn't have the sense to maneuver that stuff, you know, back then. So I'd basically fight them, you know, because uh, I'd grown up in a bit of a tougher, This they, they were from a more uh, bourgeois background maybe by that time. And I was from a different background. So, you know, I just was a, uh, I got quite angry in, uh, in my hometown near the end because I didn't feel that people were understanding what I, uh, what I was doing or supporting you, it. Yeah, what you'd actually yeah. put into the scene. And, yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah. And there was like these kind of local DJs were starting to make their name and do their thing and they were kind of more on the scene-ster kind of vibe. And I was just like, oh, I like... Uh, I don't know how to explain it, but I got a little resentful of what was happening. I needed to go. I needed to to be amongst people, amongst the industry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, like many B players, I went to Tokyo where I'd been before, you know, uh, briefly. But I And I knew some Japanese from my hotel experience year, a few years before that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just moved there in 2000. Uh, Four, I just started a record label with uh, um, Intergroove uh, Distribution in Europe and uh, moved to Japan and just established myself in Japan like right away, kind of, uh, you know, by by force. How re- did you go about that? Move into a new country and like establishing yourself right off the bat? Like... Um, did you know anyone there at the time or did you just turn up and start fucking no, sending out demos? No, no. Like, what do you do? Yeah. I knew, no, <coughs> not really. I just turned up. I had a record label that I owned with <coughs> another Japanese guy at the time. Two Japanese guys. Okay, so you already had the label going. I had the label going. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, I had put out a record. Uh, I'd put out a few records by that time. A record on a Detroit label. Uh, a soiree called Monochasm that had done well. So people knew my name in the record shops a little bit because that style, that, I mean, I just approached that niche, you know? Was it a big scene there at the time? Very big, yeah. Was it? Yeah, 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 it was already established. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Japan has a very high density population Mm -hmm. and they've been doing this as long as it's been happening. So... They, they were the first people who brought Larry Levan to be a guest DJ, you Is know, right, and stuff yeah. like that. Yep. Like way back, way, way back. They've mm-hmm. been, the, the the club scene in Japan is, so, you know, a lot of these sound system companies and I Pioneer, Vestex, it's all there. from Japan. Yeah, oh yeah, all the, all the, all the yeah. low quality stuff yeah. is like, even you know, Pioneer you yeah. know, is all made there. Yeah. And- so, you know, I went there and I just, 
you know, now that I look back, man, I just went hard. I just went hard, man. Mm-hmm. Like, I was determined and like very much focused, focused into what I was doing. I had confidence in what I was doing. It was getting played in Europe, and I uh, just, you know, uh, got to know people and put introduce myself to people. People were interested in what I was doing at that time because there was a base for what I was doing in Japan, and uh, I, pr- I I right away start I, I i've always been uh in the media that's another weird thing is i'm very into the media so you know like i said i had a uh a, a, a skeptical and uh very kind of clued in view of the media or thought i did and tried to from the beginning you mm-hmm. know mm-hmm. and i found myself in the media quite a bit when i was younger for painting on walls for beating skateboard tickets for having weird hair, for uh, being in the first rap group in Victoria, uh, making the first rap video from Victoria, throwing, you know, being part of the first rap shows, being part of the first raves. My club night was in the paper quite a lot. Yeah, I got to know writers and like Monday Magazine, Times Colonist, you know. Mm-hmm. I had a kind of a infamous status already through the media right yeah uh in in my hometown and i just when i went to tokyo i guess you could say i felt entitled to that when i got there yeah and uh tokyo is kind of a pay to play like the japanese music media is very pay to play and very high level you know but i kind of always just i'm naive about things sometimes in my favor so i just kind of like one of the first things I did in within my first months in Japan was approach uh, a magazine there, um, Loud Magazine, and say, "Loud Magazine, Loud Magazine is kind of like Mix Mag there, mm-hmm. or was at the time, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, very high readership, uh, very every it's everywhere, and." Um, I just said, hey, man, I've got, we're in Tokyo and we have this dope uh, techno label. And uh, at their time, there was this article about techno uh, in every issue. They, there was this guy who was writing these kind of like techno scene reports and, you know, what's happening. And I basically approached him and said, hey, you better write about us, man. Because Oliver Ho's playing our shit, Samuel Sessions playing our shit, Gary Martin's playing our shit. All these people are playing our shit, and we're in Tokyo, and you're like, you're not writing about us. So it's like, I basically kind of, you know, I don't, I, I, I hesitate to say this, but I can be intimidating, you know, in my way, in my little weird way. Okay. Mm-hmm. I basically was like, pretty much bullied them into it. Well, you know. Yeah, ish. You're an idiot if you don't do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, right? And But he did. He wrote about us, and uh, that was my introduction, I think. And uh, I basically found a way to stay, you know, uh, I made, I don't know how to explain it, but I made sure that people, people saw, I think, right away that I was an interesting character. And uh, there, in Japan, there's kind of like the gaijin scene, you know, like the foreigner scene and the core Japanese music scene, right? Okay. And they're, they're different. They're different, but they cross over, okay? So uh, some DJs come there and they establish themselves in the kind of foreigner scene. And it's a more scenester based scene. Like it's more like about local popularity, who you know, who you hang out with, and you know, just kind of like it is here. Basically, how cool people think you are and want to book you. And if they're your friend, maybe you have a party and they want to play it. So they book you and you play theirs and very local politicky, right? Mm-hmm. That's kind of how the foreigner scene is there, right? It includes Japanese people too. It's not. Even though I call it the foreigner scene or the gaijing scene, it's more the international scene, mm-hmm. you might say, right? Lots of trust fund people <laughs> and stuff, you know, in, in festival, people who come to Tokyo because it's a cool place to party and stuff. Yeah. So, you know, the clubs there are massive, right? And, like, there's so much venues and things like that. So uh, 
there's that scene and then there's the core Japanese scene which is made up of more like people who are well known in Japan to the Japanese people and uh, their their crews and uh and that is more like the Japanese artists who put out records and DJ and, you know, maybe they play in Berlin sometimes and that's a big deal to them. So, you know, they, they've played in England maybe. So, you know, they get some prestige. They put out some records that get played by DJs and stuff like that. So I really did a number on both those scenes while I was there. I t- did a double attack, you know, so a few DJs, did that you know there was only a couple of djs that would that would really compete in both of those scenarios and i did that and i uh eventually got myself voted into the, in the top 50 djs in japan in loud magazine in there oh, in their in their uh, ranking mm. right and once that happened and i entered at uh 26 or something like high in the tw- in the 20s and uh once that happened I uh, I could have a chart every month in the magazines, right? Started as a small chart, but then I got into the top half. Into the, I think the highest I climbed was twenty two, mm-hmm. and uh, that allowed me like a top five every month, you know, or top, you know, top. I I don't know if I had a top ten. I had definitely had a top five for a long time, mm-hmm. but my chart had my photo. That was a big deal, you know. Yeah. <laughs> After you reached past the mid mark 25 your chart could have a photo and then people could see your face right the top djs had bigger charts like you know with their full photos yeah yeah so uh (coughs) and and the and the top dj got his face on the cover for the one issue right so uh and that would be always someone like toa tay or like um uh different I forget all the DJs that ran through that, but big guys, you know, big guys. Ken Ishii, maybe he made him number one. Uh, hardly ever full on techno DJs though, because techno, just like Japan, is kind of an underground sound. But yeah, you know, like a trance guy or something, you know, yeah, would be on the front. Fumiya well, Tanaka, he is uh, no man. I don't know if he ever made a number one. He was always in the chart though. But uh, who's that guy? Um, I'm trying to remember his name. Uh, different people, anyway. And uh, as I started doing more business in Japan and putting out, I put out a couple of things like CDs were big in Japan for a long time, past where they were big here. Also, record sales. So that kept me in Japan because Tokyo was a high density record sales place. And if when, while I was living there, I could promote my records in the stores and. I did in stores and tower records and record signings and technique and stuff like that. And I could sell lots of vinyl if I stayed there and promoted it grassroots through mm-hmm. these shows. Because a lot of people bought vinyl and CDs. I put out CDs with a Japanese distributor there. And that led me to getting a, a Japanese um, booking agent, Shinya Suzuki. Once I had a Japanese booking agent, I could play really a lot up and down Japan in rural cities and rural towns and stuff like that. And that's mostly what I did in Japan was uh, on the Shinkansen, you know, go, I did, did put a lot of time on, on the Shinkansen. I had residencies in Kyoto, played there maybe 30 times in Kyoto. When I left, I had a residency there at uh, Metro, which is one of the oldest clubs in Japan. And uh, I had a residency in Tokyo too at a place called Rock West played all the all, uh, also a residency at Ageha the biggest club in Asia but not in the main room I played the pool bar the pool area but that was the where all the good underground music was happening and was you know 500,000 people in mm. your on your floor and uh, I had a residency at Saloon which was under uh, the main floor of unit, huge club unit. I played that main floor too, but I played, my residency was in the bottom floor and that was just such a great place to play if you were playing, you know, the under, underground techno and house. And uh, I had a residency, residency in Shizuoka, which I played many times at a club called Rajashan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, shouts out to Mori and Aya there. And uh, I basically, you know, 
done pretty good in Japan. Yeah, just wor- I worked a lot. I mean, yeah. while I was doing it, I never felt like I was doing really well. I was always looking at the people above me, mm-hmm. you know, and comparing, ah, oh, he's got more gigs, he's got more gigs. But uh, Tokyo is very, very competitive. Is it? You know? Was it yeah. like when you like when you uh, when you first lived there? Like, did you get a place to stay there? Did you like the, the like the culture? Well, I lived with my and... first wife. Yeah. Um, so you know that's another thing is I have two kids who are half Japanese and they were they were born in Toronto. I lived in Toronto for some time too, mm-hmm. and had a residency at a club there called the Weave across okay. from the art gallery on Dundas. And I uh, lived there for a couple of years. And um, my kids were born there, twins, twin girls. And uh, I was married there and uh, with a Japanese woman. Um, rest in peace. She's passed now. Georgia. But uh, she... Um, I moved to Japan also in 2000. Uh, and four because my marriage was on the rocks. Me and my wife uh, didn't get along. There was problems in our marriage, and I thought if I moved to Japan, you know, we could live together and try. And we had young babies at the time; they were uh, just less than three. And uh, if I moved there, then you know, maybe we can try there. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, I was angry a lot in Victoria. I was frustrated. I couldn't get ahead. I mean, the dance music thing is very limited here, you know, in, in Victoria. Even coming to Vancouver sometimes to play as a guest, that's cool and stuff. But, Do you think Vancouver's yeah. scene now is actually better, is getting better? Uh, yeah, I think so. Or I think, you know, Yeah, I think it's sort of getting a lot more. It's been through all kinds of things that were good and bad, you know, like yeah. the eras. There was great things about it back then and, you know, just... I was frustrated in myself in with myself. Mm-hmm. I needed a change. I needed to be part of the wider industry, you know? And I figured, well, I you know, we could go to Japan and do this, so we got a little apartment in Japan together. That didn't last long though. We only stayed together about another year after that. Mm. And and uh separated, but and then divorced, but I stayed in Japan and uh, I took custody of the kids too. Uh they were their mom wasn't able to look after them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but, uh, and she moved back to her hometown of Mito, but I stayed in Tokyo with the kids and, uh, basically just worked. That, that was another thing, having small kids that I was responsible for. I really had to, like, wow, if I'm going to do this and do DJing and music and stuff, I can't really mess around. Right. And, yeah. and I lost, interest in like the scene you might say and became totally focused on the industry and Mm -hmm. like you know gigs uh we're paying the bills so i was all about getting gigs and all about um climbing the ranks as a dj and all about um making records that were successful Mm -hmm. and putting out records you know i uh i i basically broke off from At the same time as my wife, I broke off also from the record label I'd built. One of the guys ended up, uh, uh, you know, sleeping with my wife while I was in Europe. (laughs) And then, uh, and then that's okay. Everything happens for a reason. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, And, um, you know, they got married eventually and stuff before she died. So they loved each other. And uh, I'd, me and her didn't really love each other in that way at that time. So mm. things were bound to happen. But uh, it made me go off on my own and um, in Tokyo. And it also made me kind of like turn my, turn my back on any scene loyalty and just I was really into the whole thing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like I wanted to play on the foreigner scene. I wanted to play on the... Japanese uh, industry side and I did I did all that and I uh, put out a lot of records while I was there tons and tons and tons of records yeah so when when you when you moved back to Vancouver then 
2011. 2011. Yeah. Was that when you started buying into like your own like equipment? So that was when you bought your first like sort of vinyl. Decks? No, oh no, no, Did no. You buy your, uh, your, you know, your synthesizers because obviously we came by. No, your no, studio I had earlier. a studio in Tokyo. Yeah. I've nice. had a studio. I've had gear since forever. You know, mm-hmm. like I've always collected anything I could. I've had DJ gear since. Um, you know the 90s yeah and then i had uh always had drum machines or this or that i had uh, the 303 mc 303 when it came out and made a record with that in the 90s yeah and uh um you know i've always gotten my hands on what what i could i built a really nice studio in tokyo I, I, over the years that i was there mm-hmm. i sold a lot of it to leave and come back here and then rebuilt the studio that you saw that's what i did in yeah, from the yeah. uk when i moved i sold it all off yeah. came here and but yeah. I know I've had a lot of gear and several studios and, you know, my whole, the whole time I was in Japan, I was producing a lot of records mm-hmm. and made tons of records. That's how I was able to climb in the, in the Japanese scene. Like, uh, I wasn't just like here. I wasn't popular with the cliquey, uh, part of the people who were making parties or stuff. I made successful records and put them in the media. So yeah. it it was like, you know, I wanted to be booked from that end. So I was booked as a guest in that way. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I you wasn't mean. your friend. I was there to play professionally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, but, um, you know, with the foreigner scene, it was very much like being friends with people and stuff like that. But I very much championed myself on my productions i mean i represented myself through my productions and was like i'm the guy who made that production you know and uh these they're they're just more i think the scene in japan because it's older and bigger is just more knowledgeable like about music you know so yeah they book the people that are selling records yeah yeah. Yeah. i mean I'm, i'm gonna go a little bit towards uh the 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 canadian scene oh yeah well Um, when i came back here it was like night and day it was different but i had a lot of knowledge yeah Yeah. and that's a good thing as well like we'll see foreign influence and bringing it in from japan into vancouver you're going to bring much more of a um diverse diverse fresh mind into building the scene here yeah when i i I looked at where you've played you've played like shambhala yeah. Um, which is obviously a massive festival and it's really good right. achievement. Um, you play Gorgamish, you've played um, Studio. <clears throat> um, what, what, like, what club stands out to you the most in Vancouver that you would say? Gorgamish. Festi- Gorgamish, yeah? Yeah, Gorgamish is, um, the- Gorgamish is like, you know, I came here to, to, to Vancouver when I moved here in 2011. Mm-hmm. It took me until about 2013 or f- to play Gorgamesh. Yeah. But once I did, the vibe between me and Gorgamesh is very good because they're striving to do something that's, it's not just part, it's something on their own, right? Uh, Vancouver, when I came here, okay, let's talk Excuse about me. Vancouver before I forget it. Yeah, let's talk about Vancouver and okay. what, you've in the, what you've got in the future plans. I think we're pretty much, sure, sure. Pretty much, uh, Sounds good. Pretty much done there. Mm. So, uh, yeah, as we've gone back, come back from a quick little PP break. Okay. Um, are we still recording? Here we are. I had a cigarette. Yeah, a cigarette? Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, so, uh, nicotine's great. Nicotine's great. So's that. <laughs> so's, so's beer. Yeah. So, yeah, the Vancouver scene then. The Vancouver. Vancouver. Back to that. So, well, Coming to Vancouver in 2011, I played in Vancouver a couple of times since I when I was living in Japan, just when I came here back here to visit. Yeah, like mm-hmm. on little vacations. Yeah, like a, not vacation, but uh, I don't have vacations, but I, I came back to play once a festival in Victoria called VEMF. Yeah. And then at the same time, I played a club here called The Lotus, right? Where was The Lotus? Where was uh, that? Was it called now, or is it still about? Yeah, was I played it, it a couple of times on a couple of different visits and a couple of different rooms too. Was it Vancouver based? Like yeah, it's Vancouver. Yeah, 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 from okay, Vancouver cool. downtown. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I guess that was 
before I moved here, that was quite a hub of activity, right? While I was in Japan, I think that was a really popular place here. And I'd been to it a, just as I left, it was starting to pop off, I think. And then, uh, then I came back here and played it a couple of times as a guest, mm-hmm. just uh, coming through Vancouver. And, um, but when I moved here, you know, I found uh, this, it almost was, I mean, uh, while I was in Japan, I had a pretty, um, my most famous and uh, successful record, which was called Devil's Water, right? And uh, it was pretty, very well-known record, uh, played a lot by Sasha and James Holden and guys like that, yeah? yeah? So I, and we sold a lot of those and it was known everywhere, so I thought that coming back here because um, people were into that record even here that I, there might be some love for me here that I could use to uh, some leverage f- some leverage my way into mm-hmm. the scene a little bit but I found that to be really once I moved here I mean Vancouver it, is it a cliquey scene to say it was cliquey is like yeah. an understatement a very vast understatement mm-hmm. it was yeah. like yeah, basically guys. like DJs and promoters here, uh, the the ones that were that I thought should be support me, right? Were basically turned their nose up at me, <laughs> uh, like oddly, like really mm-hmm. oddly, you know, like yeah. why okay? negatively, you know, like, yeah. like yeah. yeah, yeah. I didn't get it because I th- thought, oh, I have quite a good leverage, like you know, mm-hmm. it's funny, a lot of experience and stuff. Almost. Yeah, yeah. Right? No, you know, I thought so. I really yeah, thought so. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. like, I'm like, man, I've sold a lot of records right. while I was in Japan. I've and cut my teeth in the scene. Yeah, I've, I've, like that. I've, I've paid my way. Think of the experience that I have, mm-hmm. like all the people that I'd warmed up for and opened up for and stuff that yeah, yeah. in Japan and all the clubs I played, Woom, Agiha, like, like playing. I played in New York. I played in, uh, you know, all kinds of places. Right, like it, it's like that's a lot of experience. So don't you think that I could do? well by your party I and, felt like you know, that. but yeah. they they just it was like a weird thing here like v- almost a not i uh, don't know am i going to throw out the word jealousy i don't know i don't for me i, I felt like that in like, the uk because yeah. for me I, I felt a little bit like that in the uk and i thought well, you know I've, I've made records i've sold them you know people big people have played them i've played right. you know many venues and i just felt like ah for the for the for the scene that's meant to be so welcoming and 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 uh loving and embracing. loving and bringing everyone here, together you mean? here no just in, in general UK, yeah, just yeah. in uk here and yeah. in, i mean just the music scene in general right. in some what's it's very very divisive and very cut you know despite your face very uh, you know, like Craig said, a little bit jealousy well, i you think know? maybe people i also felt maybe that it was just because I'm, I'm not from here i'm from victoria but maybe like for you right i mean People who make records and do stuff with music sometimes have sour experiences in their home where they're from Mm -hmm. Um, because, well, for one thing, it's not mainstream, so they don't know. And they, you, you feel you've done something very important, but they don't know and they don't care. Mm -hmm. So that becomes a kind of a a sense of a, a source of contention I've found in my life uh when i was younger i didn't understand it as much as i do now so but when i came here uh to vancouver there was it was something different uh, than that or you know i found my way right but Mm -hmm. i found the thing to do here was what i did was uh with a friend we found a little space and started throwing some events there right and uh i get along with djs and uh, DJs they knew my record and um, party people were interested so it wasn't it it I put through some small parties people came and got to know who I was through that mm-hmm. yeah and uh, and and doing that um, I finally and and once I finally got a gig at at Gorgamesh because since I moved here, people were telling me you should play at Gorgamesh because it's kind of like 
what I'm all about, like the after hours thing. And yeah, that's kind yeah. of what I did, and especially in Tokyo. And my sound is really about that. It's really about after hours, and it's like in the middle of、there. house and techno, and it's dark, it's trippy, it's acidy, it's,、mm -hmm. it's、uh, kind of like that style, the underground style. Like I wasn't, I didn't even know that commercial EDM. And that kind of stuff was so big until I moved here from Tokyo because I was so caught up in that world. It's like just my lifestyle all the time was just that world. Yeah. And it's so big over there that you forget that it's not even that popular to the rest of the world, you know?、Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but Gorgamish was really the place that was known for that. So a lot of people told me, hey, you should be playing at Gorgamish as soon as I play, played here. Unfortunately, the person that was doing the booking at Gorgamish didn't think that. But then, you know, those people changed, and finally it changed to somebody who gave me a shot. And once I got a shot, I think it was clear I knew how to move that, those people at that time in that place.、Mm -hmm. So、uh, once, once Gorgamish became a regular thing for me and a residency was developed, I really could. Turn off my need to get into other places in Vancouver. And then, so it was more, you know, I'm really, like I said, a resident DJ. I like to have a home base、yeah. and play that club. And people come, come there, and there's like a certain vibe,、mm -hmm. there's a certain ongoing conversation. Expectations. Yeah, yeah, yeah kind of thing. Like, you yeah, know, yeah. I'm programming for a kind of a, You know, I don't like, to, I don't want to, I don't have to like win them over to my sound. So I've already got, you know, they, they're, they're, there know they're, they're there for it. They're there for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what, what advice would you give for new producers or people in the Vancouver scene on, you know, like what advice would you give them on either becoming a DJ, producer, or how they would break into the scene or, or how to even grow in the scene in Vancouver? Well, probably the advice I would give Vancouver people who want to do things in Vancouver、yeah. is probably the opposite advice as like a lot of people will give you here.、Mm -hmm. Because I noticed since I moved here, they're really people, music people are really obsessed with the, the word and the concept of community. Everything's about community. We're making a community, we're building a community, the community, the, you know, and they're at first I couldn't. Figure out what they're talking about. Like, are they talking about the gay scene? Are they talking about,、uh, you know, the music community? Like, what is that even? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. that's not a thing. You know, I was thinking to myself, like, to me, my community is, first of all, my community is where I live, who I live around, you know, like my neighborhood、mm -hmm. and、uh, the people I see at the store and stuff. And、uh, it has nothing to do with, you know, if we're friends or if we think the same or dress the same、mm -hmm. or anything like that.、Mm -hmm. I don't know their politics. They don't know my politics. I don't care, you know? So to me, that's what community means, right?、Yep. But it, I think here I found that community is really like a, a word for kind of like a group of people that are all like sort of answerable to each other. They're all like,、uh, You know, are you, they're part of the community or not? Like,、uh, it's so people here, they often, if they're trying to do music, they're often trying to appeal to this community, you know, like to the leaders of this community or the popular people in this community. But I, I, when I look at the, what the, the people who are most vocal about it or most ad, ad, advocate for it the most, They don't really seem to be involved much in the music industry. So, you know, there's not a lot of like, I'm, the people that are interest me and that, and that if I'm thinking about my music community, there are other people that do make records and stuff. Other people that make records and DJ. So you're saying、clubs. that newcomers or newcomers or advice to people is to just focus on your own records and、yeah. DJing and not be, try and be a part of the community, well, try and、I、do mean, your own thing? I think that they really get caught up in this community thing and, and、yeah. sort of forget that、um, 
well, you, first of all, you're in the entertainment business, so re- you're really trying to entertain people. You're trying to, like, uh, you know... People are going to love you for your sound and not your community sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah your yeah. community, The community stuff, I mean, that's... It's interesting but in some ways, but, I mean, it's not being a good DJ to me, right? Like, yeah. I think you should be... If you want to break into DJing first or into the music uh, industry here, yeah. scene here, I think you should be focusing on making really good releases, really good records that connect with people. You have to build a kind of fan base, right? Like that's what m- gives you leverage so that a club wants to book you is that people will come to see you, right? And people, I think in Vancouver have a, curious idea of what draw is and stuff like that they they think a lot about friends how many friends you can bring and how many people you know in the community and that will come to your DJing right but this is really like a very limited kind of way of looking at uh, Mm -hmm. of looking at what a fan base or a draw is right I mean, the, often these people are expecting to be on the DJ's guest list so they know them or they, they will come a few times to, to, to when the night's kicking off but they lose interest or whatever. It's like really what you want are people that will come see you play that you don't know personally, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like that's what a real fan base is to me, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Like... Of course, my friends support me and stuff, and I'm a friendly guy, and I have a lot of friends, so they support me. That's great, but I'm not looking at them to be the people that get me booked at a gig, Mm -hmm. right? Like, especially my age. I mean, I'm older now. A lot of my friends have come and gone through the club scene, so, you know, many of them have gone on. They have kids and stuff. They don't go out, so... I have to have a connection, you know, through to people that go out and that's because I make dance music, right? Mm -hmm. And so to me, like it's that's what it's all about. Putting out music that is known and uh being able to be kind of media savvy and stay in the media to promote what you're doing and the media you know, like I like things like what you're doing, you know, local you grassroots yeah. music media, you know, like that kind of stuff. You no know, understanding supporting that is important to me. But mm-hmm. to yeah. me, that's not supporting a community. That's that's supporting a, a industry an art. Right. Yeah. yeah the um, industry. Yeah. I want the yeah. industry to grow. Mm-hmm. Because want, again, yeah. this isn't just about music. It is about. Yeah. It's about art. Right. You know, it's about yeah. like um, creating creativity. Creating. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know? Yeah. And so. It's, and yeah. actually saying that, do you think that really nowadays, and I know a lot of people do think this, and I'm sure it's probably pretty much the, like the common, do you think to really break it in the scene in North America or anywhere that you need to be a producer as well as just a DJ nowadays? Like back in the day, you could just, be, just a be a DJ. Yeah. You could be a DJ yeah. and play other people's records. Do you think nowadays... You could still be a DJ and play other people's records. That's what... That's a lot of people from uh, you know that the DJs that we know in the scene and stuff. Uh, not all of them put out music, but but yeah. like I think more. Yeah. My question was: Do you think that is what's going to elevate you and take you to the next level to make you like a really like next level DJ? Do you think you need to do that, or do depends you think you can... what a next level DJ is? You know, like y- yeah, yeah. It's like I think that there's so many different shades and so many different scenarios i mean it's like it's like one person's doing a business compared to another like there's so many different ways to do it Mm -hmm. that i think you know it's more like to me it's more like about the substance so what are you doing like why do you want to be a dj i think that's a great answer you know it's like because it's like okay you're one of if you say well i want to be a dj because um I, it's fun, right? It's fun to DJ. I enjoy doing that. So I really want to do it more often because when you really get down to it, that's what a lot of DJs like that are just DJs. That's really what it comes down to, right? Mm-hmm. Like you're playing records. For they enjoy people. it. They're good at it yeah. maybe. And they enjoy it. Their friends like it. 
they get they have some experience with it and they they're they like dancing to djs and one time they just say i'm on gonna try that and they do mm -hmm. you know i don't know there's a, there isn't really one path to it right i think that's a great answer yeah. because I know, I know there is a lot of people that do think that ah well if you're not actually producing records you're not really i don't think true. there's any right like uh, I, I agree i don't yeah, think there people is. are always trying to say no. like do you have to do it this way or that way or this way or this way but i think one person could do it that way and be successful and another not yes and uh i think that a lot of it comes down to the substance like is your music good is your track selection yeah. good is and your, it's is not even journey? about being good it's like can things can be technically technically really good but not have any charisma mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like it's like it's like a special fluke thing you know it's like you have to just do it because you want to do it and then the just like with any art stuff mm -hmm. your success is not something that you should decide what it looks like and is going to be like because it can happen it, you know it should be organic it should be so, organic so saying that then this almost leads on to it perfectly yeah. is when you go out to play a set right do you, do you have your set laid down do you never you no you, never. you're going to play organic and just see what happens on the night of and, course i have to be able to flow with the crowd yeah, i have to be able to program because i think that like yeah. literally ties into what we were just talking yeah. about that, that and, and to me that is like the whether you put a producer part, yeah. or not a i don't producer, think you can be being a good dj i is think it where, really limits how powerful you can be as a dj if, if you if you yeah. structure a set if and you, that's if, if you, you can't go, vary from that set right if you can't vary yeah. from that structure you've laid out mm -hmm. I, I think, think it'll it sound you. tight you'll sound good Fuck if you yeah. practice it's it gonna be fucking amazing so if set. you know if you know exactly what you're doing it going into mm -hmm. so you know like for for some djs one gig is much like another i suppose but for me i play so many different variations of gigs and like some gigs people don't know who i am really some people sometimes they do I play a lot of festivals where people are there to see other acts, but I want them to like what I'm doing. So, you know, I have to be able to program. I have to be able to sense what's going on and uh, within the boundaries of what I want to do, uh, go, I mean, I have so many different colors and so many different ways. The feathers in your cap. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can yeah. present things in so many ways. Like, uh, I'm not going to play music that I don't want to play. Never. Fuck no. But, Obviously. <laughs> but uh, I, don't, I don't bring that music. But you I, play yeah. Rihanna? No. Yeah, but, you know, I I, I want to uh, have the power to, you know, go a lot of, throw a lot of different things. If I think this is going to work or that's going to work, mm -hmm. or I try something and it looks like it's working, I want to go in that direction. If it looks like it's not working or, you know, I think that's I the most go in another direction. Side of it. Yeah. It's, also, it's uh, finding, I also, you know. Yeah. I also think a lot of like sets now are becoming educational with timeless music. Don't you think that? Like, I, I, I find I, listening to a lot of the newer stuff that I do listen to. Remixing old stuff. Now. I listen. I hear yeah. so many samples and sounds that are older tracks. Yeah, you're that, kind of educated. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Like, the, I, my I think styles I, like that. I think, yeah, Renny, you could come over to my my house and go through my record collection, and I'm sure I don't have as many tracks as you do, but I got quite a chunk of wax. Okay. Got big and of wax, let's be honest. and fucking, you could listen through some of those old, and they kind of vary from like late 80s early 90s mm. to about i would say early 2000 is when i stopped buying vinyl but some of those fucking sounds and tracks you'll listen to and i know you you know oh, fuck you'd know them all anyway right Maybe. but a lot yeah. of people that didn't know them would right. listen to them now and be like well that's this track right right because uh, again just like they were back in the day because it's, it, it's, it's been sampled it's been sampled it's been reused yeah. like, look how many times you know Marshall Jefferson's been even, sampled. like they were back then even mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. you know think about it some of the classic tracks we had back then were remixes of classics from Larry Levin yeah. Ron Hardy, yeah, fucking all those boys yeah. that did the originals. That then right. the early English boys took little bits of that, right, right, and made and a rave track. It, yeah. And and at the time we thought that was the original track, but then it was actually no fuck, man, it was this, right. And actually it was sampled from an old sixties track, right, yeah. right. Do you right. know what I mean? Like, right. yeah, 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 yeah. And the whole thing in England with the <clears throat> Northern Soul, kind Northern of thing, Soul, fuck yeah, they man. Were, yeah, they were yeah. like already taking American black music and yeah. dancing to it in England and presenting it that in a different way. 
first Northern yeah. Soul was yeah. our first kind of raves. Yeah. They were the first all yes, night yes. parties where yeah. people were doing speed. They they yeah, didn't yeah. even know they were doing amphetamines back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and these kids from fucking Wigan yeah. and wherever. Right. Wigan was a huge part of the Northern Soul. Yeah, man, we're getting off on and, and that whole scene's amazing because it was tracks that didn't really make it in America. Right, yeah, yeah. It yeah. was tracks. That no, were that's kind exactly of, that's what Rave was. Too. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Like the same drum and bass as when, well. When England took uh, the stuff, like, listen, I was a fan from house of house music since day one. Since like, oh god, I don't know, like uh, the first house tapes I bought were like, you know, Fast Eddie and mm. like a lot of hip house and very the stuff that's connected to rap mm -hmm. Todd Terry when he was Royal House and stuff like this so you know I uh, I was already so familiar and into it before England like kept, shot it back at us you know but it was much bigger like England has a, a knack like there's a weird kind of symbiotic the UK relationship does do that, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah you where they'll take like underground like really like house music was so underground at that time like mm -hmm. nobody in my hometown knew it you know like few people a few people knew it yeah or, and uh you know there was like a club scandals that um you know shouts out to scott newton he was a uh, early dj influential dj at that time and you know he was playing like belgian new beat and things like that mm. there were there uh you know the house music thing was so underground until England uh, kicked it off with the oh, rave thing. Just and the whole then of the we, UK, yeah. We saw it suddenly, mm. like people people that I would that didn't weren't into it before suddenly could understand it. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like in a language they could understand somehow. And then dance music got uh, the whole thing got so much bigger around me. It yeah. kind of it was frustrating because a little bit it was frustrating because some of the rave promoters and stuff like you know that came in they kind of took it over or whatever right and then they were guys that weren't around from then and i'd be like man you don't even know about house music that's why i did the fluid night that's why i did the club night and moved it into the club like kind of back to the basics because because it was like i needed they they were losing the plot it was like they were doing the rave thing without the house thing right yeah and i was like oh no no the rave thing is their version of the house thing yes right so i was like i very much kept core like you know uh, mm -hmm. from that from that it became very important to me to always um be State very true roots. school truth, about truth stuff to yeah like i don't like the trendy shit i like the stuff that goes on and on and on and on so yeah so i'm even I play all new records in my sets now, maybe with a couple of uh, couple of classics thrown in there. Uh, I play a sound that has a lot of um, nostalgic elements in it, and and people think of it kind of like old school sometimes, but it's not really. It's kind of a hybrid. Mm -hmm. It's always like like uh, all the good things along the whole way. I just I just gather the good things and discard the trendy shit and i'm very because i've been doing this for a really long time i can see what's going to be trendy yeah i can see oh that sounds cool right now but trust me in like two years that'll sound so whack right yeah, yeah so yeah. like i i know how to get you know just keep the good stuff yeah oh like it's like a piano line you know like a really good housey piano line Carolina. it's like timeless you could draw mm. there you can use that now people yes. want to hear oh, it now yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. when it comes on yeah. they go oh i love that because you it's know timeless. it's timeless right yes. i like the timeless things but i don't just like the timeless things from the late 80s i like the timeless things from 97 there's timeless 90, things made 2003 right there's brand new yeah stuff the that's stuff timeless. that's popping right now yeah, yeah, that's yeah. timeless yeah. yeah like i'm i just <coughs> but but i want it to be a very sophisticated sound like i want it to be very like oh none of this is bullshit this is like i want it to sound as authentic as you know I, it's got to be authentic yeah like everything's real the real real deal the really mm -hmm. real deal mm -hmm. yeah so what's um your future plans then as we rush up into the show what's your future plans for yourself in 2022 with releases gigs that's going to be coming up you've got anything in the pipeline for or? gigs i'm playing on this on the 29th 
at this warehouse underground party in East Van called um, Run It. And uh, it's going to be cool. Lots of drum and bass DJs, all young oh, DJs, but with me and another guy, uh, Scotty Stylus, who's like a rave vet. He's uh, one of the cats who he, he created the famous party Soundwave. Okay. on the island that's mm-hmm. been going for a long time he started the first ones i played the first one when is it when is it again sorry uh 29th 29th of uh january okay. on a saturday yeah. yeah we should come along i think we should go i'm playing midnight to 1 30 so not so late but it's an all-nighter in a warehouse uh starts at 10 goes to 8 a.m and uh that's going to be very good it's got uh people on the lineup i'm thinking is um uh Steph Tsunami, um Mad Flavors, Solvent Sound, lots of younger DJs. So what's what's the genre? Hmm? What's the genre of music that you're gonna be pl- that's gonna be on there? Me tonight? myself, I yes. play my own sound. So be, you know, yeah, I know your sound, but like would yeah. it be like would it be like drum and bass? Yep. There? Would it be, oh yeah, yeah drum yeah. and bass. Scotty's plays a lot more breaks than I play. Mm-hmm. Uh bass music, lots of bass music, modern bass music. Mm-hmm. And um, I'll be playing, uh, you know, a, um, a ravey house sound with lots of uh, techno ra- house breaks, uh, old school, new school vibes. Uh, you know, I don't really put a lot of rules on what I do. I play no. whatever I want to play. Yeah. Um, but uh, definitely, I mean, it's going to be it's it's a rave venue. I played this. This is the third time I played this venue. And they keep making it better. It's always bumping, and they keep making it better. And uh, big sound, lots of lights. Nice. Yeah. Nice, man. It's an underground yeah. thing. Very, 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 very underground. Yeah. Nice. Perfect. I think because uh, of this whole COVID thing, and again, we said we weren't going to talk about it, which I don't want to, but I think one of the positives is it's pushed some of it back underground a little yeah. bit more. It's that. Uh, history this is, this itself. Is, yeah, and know. it's all younger people, too. Yes, yeah. mate. Throwing this. So yeah, it's like... Yeah, the guy that booked me is in his twenties. The the people that I see at the party are, excuse me, of all ages. But then there's people that are older that have been coming to see me play for a while. Yeah, that came that come out too. So you get a real good mixed vibe in a warehouse dancing, and it's a little bit it's almost taboo. Going back to, it's go, back yeah, to the going back to the roots, back to man. the like yeah, you know, rebellious like nature rebellious of what nature. we're doing. Like I said, I think that's yeah. the only positive that's come out of yeah. all this. Bullshit, I'm an anti-establishment artist. I always have been, I'm, mate, I'm, and, I, yeah. and I think that is the core yeah. of it. It's about yeah. it's it is the tr- it? the true core of it is. Yeah. And I, I've said it on numerous shows, and you know we used to say it back in the day. It's more punk than punk ever yeah, was. Yeah, that's right. It's more punk than punk ever yeah. was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why a whole load of punk, well, punk was very got punk into too. it. <laughs> punk was very punk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but don't get me wrong. A lot of, a lot of punk eyes kind of punk, as punk was ending, they 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 ended up being producers and and DJs. It's just music, a- Andrew man. Andrew Weatherall. Yeah. Andrew Weatherall's big. One, Andrew yeah. Weatherall's fucking huge one. David Holmes. Like there yeah. was so many of them. The KLF. Yeah. All those guys, like Alex Peterson. Yeah, and, and but, even but uh, the Pistols, of, uh, you know, John Lydon went on to do P- Pill, yeah. which is very like oh, uh, and he did a new few, wave synthesizers, he did a couple worked with Africa Bombada uh, and shit. Hard Hands, I was, yeah. when we were talking about your, your right. logo earlier. Yeah. Uh, Johnny, Johnny Lydon. Yeah, he's he, a he club boy, release. man. Absolutely. Yeah. He, mm-hmm. they, yeah. they all understood that it was another, it, an anti-establishment that's right. movement. That's right. It, and that's yeah. c- the core of it yeah. was, was a fuck off. We're going to yeah. do parties. This is our sound. Yes. It, we, we've we made it. We've we come have up a right it, to dance. We're uh, gonna and dance. we're going to do our parties wherever we're going to yeah. do our parties. That's right. And, and I think yeah. that's what's happening now, which looks amazing with all the young people around here. Right. Which is nice. I can't wait to see some of it ourselves. Maybe. Oh, no. it's, it's right. uh, These parties that have been going on at this place have been fantastic. I played a couple of other things at this uh, another venue in uh, um, Richmond called Fake World Studios, mm-hmm. and uh, that's run by a legendary Vancouver DJ DJ Slim. Okay. His real deal, old school rave uh, breaks DJ from the from the nineties and uh, er, you know from the nineties and early two thousands here. Yeah, and a legend in the game. He did some time in Asia also DJing. Now he's back here and has that venue. I played it a few times, and it's really badass. Very small space 
with uh, big sound system. So it's like a very lunch, intimate yeah. kind of style. Yeah. So we, you got this warehouse space that I've been playing, uh, big, bigger parties, and then you got this uh, intimate space. So even though the clubs are closed, uh, you know, recently I've been playing, you know, for people who want to do it. Yeah. I mean, if you don't want to come, you don't want to, don't come. Yeah, but, exactly. Uh, if mm-hmm. you want to right. come, then, uh, you know, I'm not ashamed to to dance and make people dance, so it's what yeah. I do. Yeah, good for you, good, man. Yeah. Well, Benny, I appreciate you coming in today, oh, man. And and also, uh, before we get off here, I want to say also, besides the parties, I got some records coming out. So if okay, you mind, yes. if I if yes. I just talk about Absolutely. that for a second, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yours, so man. I got a record coming out in 2022 with a label from Paris called Skylax. It's going to be very dope. Has uh, remixes from Sean Deason. Uh, from Detroit and Ken Ishii from Tokyo. It's going to be a big record, cool. Wax. And uh, it's um, like, uh, how can I say? It's a very throwback rave vibe. Yeah. Um, it's even got s- samples like Ecstasy and oh, stuff. Nice. Like I'll real hardcore, hardcore yeah. throwback yeah, situation. Yeah. And. Um, I also have a record coming out uh, called um, Guiding Light, a track called Guiding Light, coming out on Soiree Records, Detroit. That's one of the main labels I record for. Cool. Uh, Stuff coming out on my RF label. Please check RF out um, online. And uh, the new Tao Andra remix of Devil's Water just came out. And uh, Sean Deason, also from Detroit, uh, his EP uh, Electracid just came out. And... um, other things uh i have um a group from my hometown of victoria just put an ep out called uh, just relax they're called warehouse party mm-hmm. and uh, the guys who did that they're old schoolers from the 90s rave scene cool like we were talking about they just put out this ep very very good ep getting lots of play right now i'll tell you what as well actually yeah let's go for yeah. this yeah well Hello. we're gonna say i'm gonna keep all of these Okay. <laughs> I won't Except, get a touch of him then, though. Yeah. No, well, you can have a look, but you gave us a double. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got a double. Thanks, man. So yeah. maybe we'll give out this double to someone on the yeah. show. Yeah, that, that, go if, ahead. If someone wants That's to... a split EP that I did a few years ago with uh, Josh Garrett and Subspec. Yeah. Another techno label from here. It's got a remix from uh, sh- Chicago artist Amir Alexander of one of my tracks. And it's got Sean Deason again from Detroit. Uh, remix of Josh Garrett's Super track. Super cool. Yeah. Like He's I said, yeah. I think maybe, maybe we'll, a little raffle or something. Yeah, we'll do some kind of little yeah. raffle on the show yeah. and we'll give this one out to one of the viewers. Yeah, man. How's that? Yeah, we'll do yeah, like yeah. a little, do uh, a little raffle, show. give you can... that out. Yeah. That sounds great, man. I'd awesome. love that. I totally could, appreciate it. I could sign it or whatever. Yeah, man. You, like. you sign yeah. it before you leave. And, That'd uh, be great. Um, yeah, other stuff coming out. Uh, just keep checking my label. That's all I can say. Please support the RF label. That's my uh, give main us all your thing. links. And uh, um, also a Vancouver label coming out that I'm a part of. It's called Poppers, P P R Z. Yeah. With a local DJ, DJ Hockey, who's a really new schooler who plays great techno and mm-hmm. a timeless sound, and good underground music. And he started a label called Poppers. Um, I have a track uh, called Zaspuna coming out on a, a compilation that he's about to put out from Vancouver. Cool, man. And uh, so uh, shouts out to, to Daniel Nandorf and uh, Tanner, ho- DJ Hockey. And uh, yeah, lots of stuff coming we'll, out, man. We'll put all tons, the links up for all of this. Yeah, tons, give us all, all the links and we'll, and we'll put it all, all up, up in the video description. Yeah, and all right. All that. Yeah, man. Absolutely. All right, all right. Man. Thanks again. Thanks, Thanks for coming again, on the show, anyway. bro. It's been a great Thank chat. Thank you yeah. for having Thanks, me, man. man. I really appreciate it. I, I hope you guys succeed in what you're doing. I really oh, I appreciate uh, that, mate. I, yeah, I appreciate I, it, bro. I like the effort and, uh, you know, your uh, things like this that are me- focused on music and focused on uh, the artists who are making the music. This is how, uh, you know, Vancouver creates a, a, a true music scene and, and a true uh, dance music industry. Absolutely, man. Yeah, man. We're glad to do our little bit. We're yeah, great. and I hope we... Uh, it's nice to meet everyone. Cheers. Yeah, yeah. Cheers, buddy. Cheers, Cheers mate. That. Thank Cheers. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers, man. Best for 2022. <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. Cheers, man. <laughs>